Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to TechGeek webinar series, our endeavor to empower techies. We believe that sharing of knowledge is the key to enhance our skills and grow us as professionals. With this principle in mind, we have initiated a series of webinars conducted by industry experts to give you all a crisp insight of various domains. The topic of today's session is package selection process for web content and experience management solutions. How can we do this better? Our guest speaker today is Mr. Amit Zerxis, expert platform CNC technologies at Sapien Nitro. Mr. Amit is an expert platform at Sapient Nitro with a focus on content management and col collaboration and web content management technologies. Amit has been involved in conceptualizing, shaping, architecting, designing and implementing a number of CNC solutions at Sapient Nitro over the last 12 plus years he has spent here. He is currently responsible for supporting organizational cap capability building for CNC technologies and also supports various delivery engagements as a CMS WCM expert. Amit also has significant experience in supporting package selection efforts for WCM w, WC exam solutions. Without further delay, I introduce you all to our guest speaker. Over to you, Mr. Amit. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, are we in screen sharing mode? Can you confirm? Uh, no, it's not been shared yet. Okay, I just enabled it. Let me just check. Yeah, I can see the in desktop now. <coughs> okay, wonderful. Thank you. Uh, welcome everyone and, and thank you for taking out the time. Uh, the topic I'm going to cover today is uh, the packet selection process for WCM solutions which they were called once upon a time, you know, simple CMS or WCM solutions for those of you who have a background in that and how they really evolved now to become something much bigger and much larger, you know, something that various analysts have started to now refer to as web content and experience management solutions. Uh, and basically, how can we execute this packet selection process better and more efficiently? So I, uh, my introduction is already covered, so I'm going to skip over this. But at a very high level, I work with Sapien Nitro. My focus here is really around our content and collaboration technologies. Uh, I am myself a WCM technology expert. Um, and in addition to supporting our delivery and sales functions, uh, with uh, WCM implementation, I'm also responsible for capability building at the organizational level. I myself well versed with a number of different, uh, you know, CMS and WCM packages, including Adobe Autonomy, Jaya, and several others as well. So I'm on agenda slide three. Hopefully, everyone can see this. But uh, what I have for you today is the following. Uh, I thought it'd be good to kick off with, you know, a baseline introduction of how things have evolved from you know 10 years back when you had more simpler content management solutions or web content management solutions as we knew it back then to what we refer to today as you know web content and experience management solutions and really what the shift is and what the shift means to all of us right uh, thereafter i was hoping to dive into talking about packet selection specifically and again kind of you know talking about how we used to do this earlier and probably how we need to do this now and going forward uh, after which, uh, I'm going to present a potential framework, which uh, at least we believe is a more effective way of executing a packet selection exercise for you know, such a solution. Um, and then finally, walk through what we're calling some best practices, or as we are referring them to here, key mantras, uh, which are really you know, guidance to keep in mind as you, as you work through that process, and particularly if you're part of a team that is recommending a particular package for a for a web content management implementation this could be quite relevant to you and finally we'll sum it up with questions and feedback all right so if you think about you know web content management solutions as we as we used to look at them you know several years back uh, it was really as simple as this if you're looking at you know slide number five right now essentially what you were trying to do is build a website right it could be abc.com or anything and behind that website, you probably had a bunch of layers, which were, you know, the ability to author content for that website, the ability to publish content to that website, and the ability to deliver content to that website, right? 
And within those, fair enough, you had some building blocks, so you did have the ability to say, fair enough, do I have the ability to manage different content types and content items, take them through workflow, uh, manage them through a publishing process, and then get them out to a delivery system of pages and components and templates, right? Um, and for those of you who come from a background with any content management solution, you probably are very well versed with you know this way of doing it, uh, which is you know the classic content authoring, publishing, and delivery layer. So that's how we used to you know approach this type of solution back then. Now, what has changed today, if you think about it, is that really the method in which this content is used has changed significantly. Right today, we're really using this content to drive what we call engaging experiences. Right. And so while the basic layers remain the same, you still need an authoring, a publishing, a delivery layer, and you're still trying to push out content to a website, so that part did change. But a number of other things happened, so let's walk through them, right? Firstly, uh, the number of channels that you're trying to publish this content to suddenly exploded, right? You probably have multiple websites that are owned by the brand or by the company themselves. These could be regional websites such as Euros, US, Europe, and Asia Pacific. They could even be specific product websites. Uh, you also have the mobile channel that you're trying to deal with. You have the social channel where you're trying to reach audiences on Facebook and Twitter and, and several other places. Plus, you're trying to engage users in conversations, right? Um, and then, of course, you have even display channels, if you think about it, right, which are things like kiosks and other methods where you're using the same content uh, but to drive an engaging experience around that, right? So that's one thing that happened. The other thing that happened is that you know what we call content has suddenly changed a lot, right? If you think about content 10 or 20 years back, you would think about it as informational text, perhaps some marketing content, perhaps some data, etc. Today, content is a much wider meaning, right? We're looking at content as a as a summation of several different things, which could include product catalog content, even rich media assets such as images, videos, and, and other you know media forms. Uh, and more importantly, social content and user-generated content in the form of comments, blogs, posts, discussions, and literally everything else. And then finally, campaign content that uh, marketers are trying to use to drive conversion, right? Um, and collectively, all of that has resulted in this content management solution really resulting in driving what we refer to as a multi-channel experience, right? Uh, on the one hand, customers. Uh, want these multi-channel experiences and they want to be engaged uh, with the content wherever they are on whichever device they are. On the other hand, you've got marketers who are really asking the question of, well, how do we create these experiences, right? And hence, really, that's where the shift from a simpler CMS or a WCM solution to a web content and experience management solution really starts to happen. So if you kind of try and define the purpose of a WCM solution or WCXM solution, sorry, it will probably come down to some of these things, right? Uh, which is A, the ability to drive a consistent cross-channel customer experience, regardless of whether it's the web, mobile, email, social, display, kiosk channel. You want to be consistent in your messaging in each of those channels and how do you achieve that. Uh, you're also trying to combine traditional capabilities around authoring, publishing, and delivery with more advanced capabilities around engaging the user and really creating a richer experience, right? You definitely want to be relevant uh, to each and every user, and you want to make sure that the experience you're delivering is, is personalized for their users, so you're addressing their specific needs uh, as opposed to you know more traditional forms of mass marketing. Um, and then, really, if you think about you know marketers themselves, they essentially want to drive greater engagement with their brand. If I'm a marketer promoting a brand or a set of products, the goal of my investment in a WCXM solution is really to drive greater engagement. That's what I'm after. And then finally, if you're really a global brand or a global you know marketing firm, you're probably dealing with audiences across the globe in different regions, in different languages, in different cultures. And, and then the challenge is, okay, how do we address them? We obviously can't deliver the same content and marketing messages to someone in China as we would to someone in the US. So how do we deal with that, right? And that's really where the WCXM solutions start to come in, or that's really where the complexities begin. So, so that's kind of important to realize, and you know, if you kind of read through that, as, as how the shift from a simpler CMS solution to a WCXM solution has happened. So this view on, on slide number eight, if you're seeing it, is really a summary of uh, you know 
the broader capabilities of what a web content and experience management solution could have. By no means is this a, is this a finite list or a complete list. It's probably much more than this, but this is probably the bare minimum uh, that you need. And if you notice, the, the traditional bits around basic content management and content delivery is still there. That's not gone away. But a number of other things suddenly came into place, right? From, from DAM capabilities with digital asset management to multi-channel delivery capabilities, from specific capabilities around marketing and commerce to other capabilities around advertising and personalization and targeting, suddenly the, the ask from what customers need from such an implementation and such a solution is much bigger. And it's not just limited to you know maintain my website or maintain content on my website. It's really about all of these things put together right, in some shape and size. Um, obviously, there are a number of players in the market who claim to provide such a product or such a package you know, using that term. Some of them are listed here. This is also not a complete list, but obviously each of these are our leaders in their respective right, and each of them have offerings, you know, which which claim to provide a complete WCXM solution, uh, meeting some of these capabilities in the diagram that you see here. So, with that said, um, let's move on and let's take a look at what specifically has changed about packet selections, how we used to do this earlier, and how we do this now, right? Um, so to set some context, and just to make sure we all you know, use the same terminology here, uh, when, I, when I refer to a packet selection, I'm basically referring to a process to help identify the most appropriate package, or it could even be a combination of packages, to implement as the solution for a particular customer, given a particular business problem. Right? Uh, now obviously, these packages in question could be you know, fairly wide. This is a huge marketplace for anyone who's been in the industry and specifically has had a CMS focus for a while, you would know that there's 100 plus or maybe even more commercial players out there you know, with various uh, offerings and packages and solutions, uh, you know, COTS packages as we call them, and in various tiers. You've got enterprise solutions, you've got mid-tier solutions, and you've got lightweight solutions, uh, and with different technologies. You've got Java-based you know, uh, technologies, .NET-based technologies, and even PHP-based open source technologies. So this is a fairly fragmented and scattered marketplace, uh, which actually makes the packet selection process even more complex. Because if you were a customer wanting to implement such a solution to drive greater customer acquisition, for example, you're faced with a choice on which package is the right one to go with. Um, and you know the landscape out there is so fragmented that you're dealing with multiple choices. So how do you narrow it down? And how do you figure out which one is the right one for my business needs? That's essentially what today's webinar is about, right? So if you think about how we used to do this earlier, and it's quite possible that a lot of us still approach it this way today, um, we really looked at it as a, as a two-phase process, right? Where in the first phase, you kind of thought about, OK, there's hundreds of vendors out there. How do I narrow it down to a kind of more short list of maybe five or six or seven vendors at best, and say, these are the ones I want to go with right, for my implementation? So, so I could start with a long list. And then I would apply some, some research based on external data, analyst data, et cetera, and try to narrow down to some sort of a short list. And merely from there, go on to a more kind of detailed process to kind of figure out, OK, this is the one preferred package that I would recommend for my customer, or if you are a consultant, that you would recommend for your client. right? Um, now, within this process, you would typically, in the past, rely very heavily on some of these tool sets. Right? You would build a detailed evaluation scorecard you would come up with a long RFP that you would send to your vendor and say, you know, tell me how your product does on these five parameters and these 50 criteria. Or you would ask the vendors to come in and do demonstrations and you would say, let's see your product in action and then let's figure out, you know, which one really works for us, right? And here's an example of how an evaluation scorecard would look like. So that's, that's commonly and traditionally how such packet selections have really been done in the past, if you think about it. So if you ask us the question about what is not very productive about doing it this way, right? So there's a couple of things. Um, for one, you are trying to build, you know, what I call a laundry list of really product features for comparison. So for example, you'd say, well, I need multilingual, and I need personalization, and I need good workflows, and I need a five, you know, other things in that list. Um, and then you're working with vendors and saying, now can you, you know, respond to this RFP document with a detailed list of uh, how your product meets these features. And often what you get back, quite honestly, is very cookie cutter in nature, right? So keep in mind that these vendors probably receive thousands of RFPs in the year. 
And so you're probably going to get back very standard, very canned responses in the form of marketing collateral or equivalent and say, yes, these are the three things we can do and you know, here's how we do it and blah, right? And so you've gotten very kind of boilerplate material, if I can use that word, right? Now as a result of that, a few things happen. Uh, for one, what you're really ending up evaluating then is really how does the product deliver on a feature and you're focusing much less on what the business user really needs, right? So in other words, you're probably trying to answer the question of how good is XYZ, right? Adobe, Interwoven, Jaya, Joomla, Drupal, whichever one, at a particular feature, right? Could be workflows. But you're not answering the question of, well, what aspect of workflows is relevant to my business and correspondingly, which of these products delivers on that aspect, right? Um, and in the process, you're relying on, you know, tools such, such as evaluation scorecards or vendor marketing collateral or you know standard vendor responses to kind of make your decision right um, and hence you know that's really where this probably needs to change because if you think about it uh, it's very difficult to apply a one size fits all approach here right if you if you're if you're someone who's a consultant to many clients you would realize that each client has a unique set of business needs um, and hence the right package for one customer may not be the right package for the other customer right uh, and what you recommend for one may not work for someone else. And kind of factoring that into your evaluation process is, is quite important if you think about it, right? Uh, and hence you need a broader frame to approach this entire topic of packet selection than the traditional way of doing it. So that's the big question. The big question, okay, so what's really changed? Or at least what needs to change about you know, packet selections, right? Um, so a couple of things. Let's walk through it. Uh, Earlier, you know, you were really evaluating for something like this. If you're looking at slide 14, you're evaluating for a stack, which is, you know, uh, those three needs. I need mean authoring capabilities, publishing capabilities, and delivery capabilities. And essentially, that's the scope of what you were looking for. Today, you're evaluating for something like this, right? Where the set of capabilities you're asking from a traditional content management or web content management solution have suddenly exploded and therefore you're dealing with a number of other capabilities. You're dealing with BAM, you're dealing with social, you're dealing with personalization, you're dealing with advertising and hence you're kind of moving the bar in terms of what you're asking for in the breadth of the solution. Right? So that's one important one in terms of how it affects your package selection process because now you're asking for a lot more typically. right? The other thing to keep in mind is that earlier you were probably focusing more on you know, features and functions, right? which is I need a CMS that can do multi-site, that can do workflows, that can do personalization. Fair enough. Uh, but here's the confusing part. right? What do you want about each of them? When you say you want multi-site or workflows, what exactly do you intend to do with it? right? Uh, and that's where you need to get a little more specific. So if you kind of pick one of these examples, uh, what type of multi-site model do you want? In this case, perhaps the customer is asking for a multi-site model just because they are you know, a CPG client, a retailer who has multiple brands, and maybe each of those brands has multiple products and they need a separate site or a separate marketing destination for each of those products. And therefore, the content may very well be unique to each of those brands, but the design and the templates and the presentations may very well be common. Now, okay, that's very specific. Now you're talking about certain very specific needs that you're asking for from this particular customer, right? And hence, uh, that frame of looking at that requirement is much more valuable than just saying well, all I need is multi-site, right? Uh, so it's important to think about it that way. Uh, the same thing applies in terms of how you draft your evaluation criteria, right? Uh, so I often run into situations where, you know, I get, I get statements both from internal teams and from customers and say, you know what, we are down to our final two uh, or our final three products and we need to make a decision and we are running into statements like this, you know, both the products can do multi-site, but which one is better? Both of them can do workflows, but which one is better? And both of them can do personalization, but which one is better, right? And, and the point is you're spending a lot of energy on trying to answer which one is better, but what you're probably not focusing on is the fact that beyond the which one is better, you really need to define what is contextual you know, to your particular implementation or your particular need. So what do you mean by multi-site workflows and personalization in this context, right? And that really makes the decision of whether one product works better for you or another one works better for you, right? Uh, so for example, if you, if you say I need multi-site, right, I would typically go back to a customer and say, well, which multi-site model do you need? Do you need something that's more on the left 
where you have a bunch of independent sites and you've got content for those sites and fair enough you may have hundreds of those uh, or you need really some sort of a site relationship model or a site hierarchy where maybe you have sites in different languages or maybe sites for different regions and now you need the ability to share content between those sites or the ability to localize content in that process from a parent site to a child site. So which one are you really after when you say, you know, I need multi-site because at that level of detail you're likely to find the difference in the two or three products that you're evaluating. But if all you want to tell me is I need multi-site, quite honestly it's difficult to pick an answer as to which one is going to work for your need. And here's a more detailed articulation of that. I won't read through this. I'll let you take a look at it while it's up on the screen. But it's the same use case, right? As opposed to saying we need multi-site, here's an attempt at a customer trying to explain the three or four final shortlisted product vendors or package vendors that this is what they really mean when they say multi-site. All they're basically saying is we're a global company. We've got multiple brands. For each of these brands, we manage various campaigns and we've got a whole bunch of sites around these campaigns in various languages, right? So as you can imagine, you're talking about a multiplier factor here based on brands, based on campaigns, based on languages and regions. And then what they're more specifically saying is we've got a model where content that is created for a campaign may be shared across the various regions in which that campaign runs, but then may be localized by language or by territory or by geography for a particular you know, region. Now that's quite specific. When you say that's what you need with multi-site, now you've really defined it to a level where you have a fair level of understanding of what you expect from a package. So now when you evaluate A versus B versus C product, you're in a much more informed position to say, well, this is what we need. And you know, here's how, here's how it's likely to work with product A versus product B. All right, and then the other thing that's changed, you know, keeping on with the theme is what has really changed about packet selections and how we used to do this earlier and how we do it now, is that earlier you used to think about, you know, a solution as a point solution, right? And what I mean by that is you used to think about solution scope is, okay, we've got to stand up this, you know, WCM implementation or CMS implementation. It'll have so many templates, so many components, so many content types, so many workflows, and we're kind of done once all that is done, right? Uh, now that hasn't changed. We still implement all of that stuff. So I'm not saying that's changed. But here's what's happened. Now, with the with the shift in the in the paradigm we went through earlier, which is consumers accessing your content through multiple channels, consumers desiring a richer experience, consumers wanting to engage with you and interact with you on social channels, and the whole need to deliver more personalized messaging to your consumer. What you're asking for is not a point solution. What you're asking for is a platform, a platform that delivers capabilities that really span across a number of these things. And given that, from a you know systems perspective or from a development lifecycle perspective, it's quite likely that you're not going to talk about some sort of a big bang approach where you're going to deliver all of that in one single go. You're probably going to work towards a, a roadmap with your customer to say, we're going to implement capabilities incrementally across different releases where, for example, we'd start by introducing marketing content management, roll it up into personalization capabilities, supplement it with the ability to have social capabilities, and then finally deploy rich media asset management or DAM capabilities, right? And we see that for our customers as well. You know, that's, that's a typical roadmap they follow. The sequence may differ by customer. But the point about packet selections is this. The point about packet selections is when you're picking a vendor, you may be initially picking them only for that first release, for that release one, which is their ability to deliver this piece of the puzzle, the marketing content management bit. But if you have a roadmap of capabilities that you are likely to deploy over time, you need to have some sort of visibility into whether the vendor has a current offering or a strategy to deliver a comprehensive offering or some sort of integration that allows you to you know, fulfill this entire roadmap over time. And hence, when we now think about solutions, we really think about solutions from the perspective of such a roadmap. And we ask ourselves the question saying, okay, well, which packages or which vendors can support us with this journey and how? And how will we make sure that when we pick something and we do something with it, we can extend it over time to add on these capabilities, right? So with that, um, the reality of packet selections for a WCXM solution, as it is called today, is really this, uh, which is one, as I mentioned earlier, it's important to note that each solution is not the same. And it's really going to be driven entirely by the business needs and the business requirements. 
And even though if you are a consultant or a developer or an architect who's worked on multiple CNS projects, you would know that uh, in all likelihood, what you do for one customer is going to be somewhat different from what you do for another customer, purely driven by what their business needs. Right? Obviously, there will be reuse at a more technical level. At the same time, the business purpose of why someone is investing in a WCX solution is very different. Right? The other reality of it, as we mentioned earlier, is that given the complexity of capabilities we are asking for, given that we are asking for WCM and DAM and social and personalization and search, it's likely, or rather I should say it's unlikely, that you'll find a single package to deliver the entire comprehensive offering. You are likely to deal with a scenario where you're either talking about integration across products and packages, or you're talking about some sort of a you know larger vendor suite with multiple different products kind of pre-integrated together for you, right? But it's unlikely that given the breadth of what we call the WCXM solution, that you'll find the answer to all of that within one single package, right? Um, and hence, what you need for your WCXM solution, quite honestly, may not be the same stuff that I need, right? For example, you may have a compelling need to, to repurpose videos for delivery to multiple channels, including broadcast channels or mobile channels, in which case you probably need some sort of a media management system or a digital asset management system for doing that video processing. I, on the other hand, probably only need to deliver images um, you know, over the web or something like that, in which case I probably really don't need that investment in a rich media management or a damn system. And hence, recognizing that differentiation is important. Yeah? Uh, the last two points are equally important, which is it's important to appreciate that vendors will claim to have similar capabilities or seem to have similar capabilities. Uh, and that's even more prevalent if the only thing you're going to tell them is we need multi-site. Probably everyone's going to come back and tell you and say, sure, we can do multi-site. Uh, and hence the need to kind of define it more specifically and more contextually. Um, and then finally, uh, given the fragmented landscape, there's a lot of overlapping capability, right? For example, basic ability to manage images and image metadata is something that even many WCM systems can do. At the same time, you know, you could have an advanced digital asset management system that you would deploy uh, to kind of do the same thing or even more. For example, you know, transform images into different renditions for different channels. And so you start to ask yourself the question of saying, okay, that basic image management capability is available in both the packages. Which one do I really need and do I really need both and why, right? Uh, and then finally, it's important to appreciate that selecting a package is really the start of a long journey. You are essentially making a partnership with a vendor and their package offering. And really, once you've selected the package, your journey begins by implementing it, customizing it, deploying it, rolling out multiple online properties on it, and then seeing it through a lifespan of enhancements, uh, platform upgrades, and so on and so forth. And hence, you know, while that decision is critical and important, it's important to realize that it doesn't stop when you select the package. It actually starts when you select the package. So before I go on to the next uh, portion of this, we are about at the 30 minute point in this in this presentation. Let me give a quick look and see if there's any questions so far in the chat panel or if anyone has any questions. Uh, otherwise, we can move on. Uh, moderator, can you let me know if there are any questions so far? Uh, no, there are no questions as such right now. You can carry on with the session. Okay, wonderful. I will continue in that case. Guys, if you have questions, please feel free to post them on the chat panel. There is a chat panel that you can post them. I'll take those at the end of the session, but if you have those in between, feel free to you know, post your questions and we can take them at the end of it. Okay, so, so this is something we've come up with. Uh, we've tried and tested it at a few different places and it seems to work well for us, which is really a framework for, for how one would execute such a packet selection, right? Okay, so the basic process, as at least we have started to approach it now, is you essentially start by asking the why question, right? And the why question is really understanding the customer's business drivers, which is, so why does our client need a WCXM solution? Why are we doing this? What is the business purpose? Are you trying to increase customer acquisition, gather more customers? Are you trying to build more customer loyalty? Are you trying to drive greater conversion and greater sales through the online channel? Why are you doing this, right? It's always important to start with that, that why question. Uh, after which you kind of answer the what question, which is your business use cases, which is what are you going to use the solution for? And what are the use cases that will be satisfied by the solution? For example, 
Are you looking to deploy marketing campaigns to essentially create campaigns by, by season like Thanksgiving versus New Year? Or is there an intent to you know, deploy a more permanent uh, you know, product catalog site to showcase your product content? Or what is the intent? Right? What do you intend to do with it? Uh, and then kind of figure out the which. And what I mean by that is what do you need? Which capabilities and which building blocks do you need uh, to deliver this solution? And correspondingly, which packages can help you? Right? And so there's a mapping process in saying, because I need these capabilities, for example, because I need you know, video processing or image processing, therefore I probably need to consider a DAM package or something like that. Right? Uh, and then finally, the house, right? where you start to kind of get into the more details and you ask yourself the question of saying, okay, how exactly will this stack be leveraged for my solution? How will users work with it? Uh, also, how will the solution deliver against a given business process, right? And so on and so forth. So there's a bunch of those questions that you ask yourself, right? Uh, at a more detailed level, this is kind of the roadmap that, that we've come up with internally. Um, and I'll let you read through the detail on the slide or look at the recording offline. But at the highest level, what we are essentially saying is that it's very important to approach this process in three phases, right? Where you start off by not looking at products, by not looking at technologies, by not looking at packages, but by asking the basic question of what the customer business problem is and why are they trying to invest in a WCXL solution, right? And as you go through that process, what you're really trying to do in phase one is really get to a common agreement of saying this is the business problem here are the key requirements we are trying to deliver against. And correspondingly, at the highest level, this is the conceptual view of the solution we need. For example, certain customers may have a strong need to use a WCM solution to engage their customers in conversations. Now, that very statement tells you that, fair enough, there's probably going to be a heavy need for a social capability as you approach that. So then you probably prioritize social as one of the key capabilities you are after. right? So it's important to define the business problem so that you can get to a reasonable view of what the customer wants and correspondingly what is the nature of solution they're seeking. Right? Having done that, you can probably move on to a more rapid assessment and initial recommendation. Uh, like, you, know, you can take those capabilities and say, fair enough, let's identify a long list of potential packages and vendors that could deliver on that. And let's rapidly evaluate the capabilities to get to a quick shortlist. And the point is that this exercise must be done rapidly. It's not something that you should spend weeks and weeks on. Because the intent of this process is really, or this phase two, is really to narrow it down to a short list of not more than two or three packages, or maybe four at best, that you can spend more detailed time on evaluating and essentially get to a point where you're then you know, really going into the specific business needs uh, and as I'll explain in a while, business scenarios, right? So at the end of phase two, what you would have is you would have gone from a long list of packages to a more short list of packages, right? And say, fair enough, these are the three I'm after, right? For example, it could be Adobe Interwoven and something else. Uh, in the last phase is really where you take that short list of packages and you take them through a more detailed evaluation. What we recommend is to use a scenario-based evaluation process. Right, which is essentially the ability to say that can we articulate our business needs in the form of real life scenarios that would describe how our users really work with the system. Right, so kind of look at it as a day in the life of a marketer, a day in the life of my customer. How does my customer get into this experience? How does he find the experience? How does he work with the experience? or a day in the life of a marketer. How do they create content? How do they integrate content with creative assets? How do they deploy content? How do they create personalized experiences? And if you have the ability to articulate that as a scenario, saying this is what we want the solution to deliver, and if you're able to take that scenario as the basis for all your detailed evaluations, whether you're sitting down with a vendor and asking them how their product will deliver, or whether you're doing a vendor demonstration, or whether you're even doing a proof of concept, uh, that scenario can be pretty useful to kind of doing very specific guidance as to how you expect to use the product within your environment. And we'll talk about scenarios in a little bit uh, after this. Uh, but uh, approaching it in those three phases in our mind is important. And like I said, the, the biggest start is to make sure you don't jump the gun and don't directly get into technologies, but instead start with the business problem definition. Uh, and then you end it with a more detailed scenario-based evaluation of your shortlisted packages. Even though this diagram may not indicate otherwise, 
you probably want to spend the least amount of time in phase two, which is the rapid assessment process, because you want to get through that quickly. You want to spend a reasonable amount of time in defining the problem itself, and then, of course, doing a more detailed scenario-based evaluation for your shortlisted packages. Yeah. The other thing to keep in mind, and we talk about this, is there is a ton of industry collateral. I will point you to some of that to help you with phase two. There's Forrester reports, there's Gartner reports, there's the Real Story Group, and there's several other analyst firms that have data that can be readily used and leveraged to do something like a phase two, which is to do a rapid assessment, where you really need to, as a consultant, if you're advising a customer, where you really need to play an important role, is marrying that data to their business needs and their specific business scenarios and saying, how is this relevant to you? All right. Um, so with that, uh, I'd like to walk you through some basic best practices, as we are calling them, you know, key mantras, um, and talk about how we've applied them, how we've applied them to, to you know, our packet selections and how we've used them. Uh, so I've got a list of them down here, if you can see them on slide 24. I will walk through each one of them one by one but just reading them out really quick and then we'll go through each of them one by one. It is important to make sure you choose the best fit package for your customer. It is important to make sure you evaluate for the full solution and not just you know basic content management needs, for example. Uh, it is very critical to look at important business requirements and not everything, because keep in mind, and we'll talk about this, that there are specific things that are typically most important to a particular customer or a particular business, which is the why question. Why are you investing in a WCXM solution? So it's important to focus on those critical business needs. Uh, you do want to pay a lot of attention to the users of the system, particularly the content authors and the editors of the system, and make sure that you're focusing on their process and their needs. Uh, then, as I mentioned, you do want to use scenarios to drive a detailed evaluation process. Uh, any vendor demonstrations you do should be aligned with those scenarios, and we'll talk about this in a bit, but you know, you should avoid using an approach where the demo is scanned. Uh, instead, you want to then make sure that the demo is you know, based on the real business scenario that you define. And finally, to the extent possible and time and budget permitting, you do want to get some degree of hands-on you know, support with the package. In other words, you do want to get hands-on yourself with the package, you know, get your hands dirty, try it out, and before you recommend something that you're going to spend a million dollars in licensing or something like that on, get to feel the package yourself, right? That is quite, that is quite critical. So without any further ado, let me walk through them one by one. All right, so, so here's the first one, right? So you, which is choose the best fit package for the customer. And the point is pretty simple here, right? Uh, you don't want to blindly follow the analysts or the marketing buzz or the hype. There's a lot of hype around certain packages. There's a lot of marketing buzz around some of them. There's a lot of analyst reports out there which are very good and very useful, don't get me wrong, uh, but you don't want to blindly follow that. You want to use that as input, but then you want to ask the basic question of the why and then articulate your customer needs as use cases so that you're mapping the data sensibly, right? So it's important to map features and functions that you're asking for to business use cases. So it's not about whether workflows are delivered better by package A or package B. It's about this is what my customer needs and correspondingly this is the package that is likely to work, right? Which basically, you know, leads to the idea or the notion of saying bye-bye feature-driven selection and hello business use case-driven selection, right? Which is don't don't get into criteria which just says I need workflow or I need multi-site. Get into criteria which say as well here is my use case for workflows, and here is my use case for multi-site. Right? So that's an important one to start with. The next one, and we kind of talked to this before as well, is that recognize the breadth of your solution. Right? Uh, recognize the full breadth of what you're trying to build and what you're trying to deliver. Um, and then try and articulate that breadth via some sort of a conceptual architecture view, right? with the ability to say that while we do need content management and delivery capabilities, we also probably need social engagement capabilities and personalization capabilities. And by the way, these are the various pieces of the puzzle that we need to fulfill those capabilities, right? And as you think about that, keep in mind that there are two different solution models of how these apply to packages, right? One solution model is the idea of what I refer to as a, as a pre-integrated single vendor suite. The other is the idea of a custom integrated best of breed model, right? So obviously in the former model, you're trying to find a fairly you know, a significant player in the market who claims to have an offering that can seamlessly deliver all the capabilities you need in an experience management solution, from from web content management to digital asset management to to search to social to personalization, and really has a as a full suite around those capabilities that you know is is fully functional 
and is fully pre-integrated, right? Your other choice, which is an equally valid choice for a customer and a consultant to consider, and given the current marketplace we have, is a best of breed integrated model or a custom integrated model, right? Where you would, for example, pick something for your WCM system, pick something else for your DAM system, and pick something else for your social system, right? But agreeing on which model you're likely to go down is, is useful and it's important because that also defines the scope of your packet selection. In other words, are you trying to select a DAM system, a social system, and a WCM system independently, and then trying to integrate all of them together? Or are you trying to find a vendor who has an all-in-one comprehensive pre-integrated solution uh, you know, so that you're safe the hassles of integration. And it's important to define that upfront and say which conceptual model works better for us and why, and what are our choices, right? Correspondingly, that may actually lead to multiple packet selection streams, right? For example, in Sapien Nitro, we've done some fairly large implementations where it wasn't just about a CMS or a WCM selection. We've got a DAM selection running in parallel, a social selection running in parallel, and a search selection running in parallel. And then you're trying to figure out how all of these things come together. Hence, it's kind of important to look for the complete solution, as I, as I mentioned, as opposed to just pieces of it. All right, the next thing is the notion of, of separating what I refer to as commodities from differentiators in a packet selection, right? And here's what I mean by commodities, right? If you, if you look at the larger you know, types of capabilities that traditionally content management systems have been used for, they would come down to some fairly basic things. For example, you need the ability to define content types, you need the ability to have content authoring form, and so on and so forth, right? Now the fact is this, the fact is if you look at some of the larger enterprise WCM players, each of them have a reasonable capability across those. Fair enough, they will still have differences in, in how they deliver that particular aspect of functionality, but it's quite likely that some of those basic library functions, if I can refer to them that way, are not fundamentally different, right? So, so the last thing you want to do is to spend five weeks of effort building a criteria of 50 different evaluation parameters and saying, you know what, out of those 50, 45 of them, all the four vendors that we shortlisted are at par. They all do it the same, right? In which case your client is confused and you're confused as to what the real value of this packet selection is. Why did we spend five weeks just getting to a conclusion that you know, the three that we were originally considering can all do the same thing, right? Um, and hence, you really need a method of filtering out the, the differentiators and highlighting, you know, what is what is relevant to a customer and also what is different about each of the packages. Uh, now, this is where in our experience, a more lightweight tool of doing this filtering has proved to be a lot more beneficial, right? So, for example, in this case, we've used this sort of a visual tool, uh, which we refer to as a business context diagram or a BCD, to really plot out the capabilities and then say, okay, how does package A compare to package B, right? And you have the ability to very quickly to do a red, yellow, green type marking and say, this is how each of them compare. And where this helps is that you can then quickly zoom in on the specific differences that matter. You may find that out of 20 things here, 10 of those are at par across the packages you're considering, but maybe five or six of those are where there are differences and that's where you want to dive deeper and really understand what the differences are and how they are relevant to their use case. And so that method of quickly filtering out commodities, you know, from the differentiators is hence important, right? And you don't want to spend days and weeks doing this. You want to have a process that allows you to get through this very quickly and very efficiently. All right, so moving on, uh, I, I see some questions coming in the chat panel. I, I'll take them at the end of it if that's okay with everyone. I can see a bunch of them coming in. But uh, but I'll take them at the end of it if that's okay. Uh, all right, fair enough. So so let's move on. The next one I think that's useful and important to consider as well is that ultimately um, you are delivering the solution, at least the authoring side of the solution, for a bunch of business users, for a bunch of marketers, for a bunch of content authors or editors, right? And hence the question is. Uh, they are the guys who are going to drive successful adoption of your solution. They are the guys who are going to accept the solution or not accept the solution for that matter, right? So the question is when you made a packet selection decision, were they involved, right? Um, did they see the package in action? Did you apply their authoring process to their needs? And that's quite important because ultimately, technically you may evaluate the package on 30 different criteria and, you know, okay it or deny it. 
but if your authors and editors are not bought into the process, you know, quite honestly, uh, it's likely to fail when you actually deploy it for your end users, right? Uh, and hence, if you kind of think about it that way, you've got to think about different editorial models as well, right? And and the classic difference between what I refer to as content-driven authoring or page-driven authoring, right? Um, visually illustrated below here, but best explained by the use case of, you know, a online news publisher versus a digital marketing campaign producer. So if you think about news publishers, right, for those of you who work for a news and media client, or for those of you who've done a CMS implementation for a news and media client, you would know that, you know, from, for them, the, the real key factor is a time to market. If you've got breaking news, if a journalist walks in with breaking news, you want to get that out quickly, it needs to be fast, it needs to be quick, you don't want to waste time in, in you know, things like, you know, designing the page, laying out the page, you want all of that to be predefined, pre-configured, you just want to type in your news story and go, and it needs to be there, right? So your, your authoring process is very content driven in this case, right? You're focusing on creating your content, your assets, and publishing it out. So it's kind of following the first view of it that you see here, right? On the other hand, if you're a marketing campaign producer, if your goal in life is to promote your brand or several products under your brand and create a whole bunch of interactive campaigns to promote that brand, you're probably very worried about experiences and you're probably very worried about how you design which experiences uh, for your customers. And hence, while you are worried about the content, you're equally worried about the composition of that content. You're equally worried about the design, the experience, the layout, and you want to have a lot of control. More importantly, you want to have the flexibility in exercising what I refer to as creative freedom, which is my ability to design my own campaign without getting IT and developers to come in and do development every time I you know, need to design a new layout or every time I need to design a new page. Um, and hence, what you're really asking for is a page-driven authoring model, right, and the ability to kind of work more with this style. So there is a subtle difference, but the difference is quite important when you factor into your packet selection, right, which is certain packages are inherently more content-centric in the way they work, right? They may claim to support the other model as well, but they are inherently more content-centric. On the other hand, certain packages are inherently more page-centric. So the big question is, what do your editors need, right? What are they likely to work with? What are they likely to be more successful with, right? We've seen and we've done implementations where models recommended one way and actually needed the other way tend to fail, right? Because essentially your customer wants to work with the system in a certain way, whereas you're forcing them to work with the system in a different way, and that could lead to issues like more user training, poor system usability, and so on and so forth, right? And you obviously want to avoid that. All right, and the next one, which we've hopped on a few times now, but is the importance of business scenarios, right? And how do you do that? Uh, and so the, the idea is to, you know, do away with what I used to call the classic 500 line item Excel sheet, right? You know, I remember 10 years back on this on this packet selection project I was, I was handed over a 500 line item Excel sheet and say, please fill in what these five products do, you know, against 500 uh, criteria. And obviously that was a nightmare to try and fill in 2,500 cells. But beyond that, you question yourself that even at the end of that journey, what value did you add to the customer? You probably had a huge Excel sheet, but... Uh, in terms of helping making the decision, was that really valuable? And that is a little questionable, right? Both in terms of the effort spent and the time spent, but also the value of that deliverable. Uh, and at the same time, it's also not useful to have, you know, features which are really stated as keywords. The same point about I need multi-site, I need workflows type of stuff. You know, that doesn't help either because then I don't really know what you want and what you're after. Um, and hence, it's quite important to use this idea of a, a real-life usage model to clarify your requirements and then really use that real life usage model to drive everything from your vendor discussion to your vendor RFP to your product demonstration to your proof of concept and so on and so forth, right? So for example, if you're seeing the graphic here, one way of doing this is you're saying, I need multilingual, which is okay, I understand that. Or you could say what I really need is the ability to manage a content hierarchy across different regions and across different languages where I have both localization and translation needs. Now that's quite specific, right? Now you went away from this idea of uh, a keyword or a feature which was just multilingual to this idea of saying, here's my scenario. I need the ability to create global content in a language, let's say English. From there, I need the ability to regionalize that content in English for North America and Europe, which means even though it's English, for North America it's different and for Europe it's different. And then within those major regions, I need to have it translated for different languages, right? So you now start to see 
the real use case for multilingual needs, which is different from if I just told you all I need is multilingual, right? All right, and then the same concept applies to you know your vendor demonstrations as well, which is uh, often you will run into the temptation of inviting a vendor who will have their you know out of the box demonstration site, which may be good to demonstrate the product features, and, and fair enough in some cases it may be a compelling demo as well. But that's where you kind of need to draw the line, you know, between what is sales talk versus what is the implementation of your business scenario and your business process, right? So it's not about a canned demo. It's not about, you know, here is what the product does, and it's not about here is a demo site that shows it in action. It's more about saying, well, here is what we need of the product, and can you demonstrate that for us, right? It could be a scenario around how do you drive greater engagement. It could be a scenario around how do you drive greater personalization, and so on and so forth. But in my opinion, it's fairly important to guide your to guide your shortlisted vendors and to encourage them to bring demonstrations that are much more relevant to what the customer really wants. Because not only does that help the business users, you know, on the customer side gain greater confidence in what they are seeing, but they're able to correlate to what they're seeing out there in terms of this is really what I want, right? Uh, pretty much in terms of my business needs. Um, and then obviously internally you want to make sure that you know you've got the stakeholders across business and IT and marketing participating in these demos. That's very important so that you can get the feedback. Uh, this is also a good opportunity to push what I refer to as the single suite vendors to demonstrate their full business process, right? So for example, if you're inviting one of those large enterprise players who claim to have everything in one solution from you know WCM to DAM to search to social collaboration, one of the things you want to test as part of this demonstration is do you have those pieces in silos, or do you have the entire solution integrated and stitched together, right? Because if you think about it, there's a lot of touch points between how these systems talk to each other. And, and the last thing you want to run into is that you're actually buying six independent products uh, from the same company and then taking on the headache of how you want to integrate them versus you're buying a pre-integrated solution. So this is also an opportunity to kind of guide your, your shortlisted vendors to say, Let's demonstrate the end-to-end -end business process. And here's an example for you know a retail firm or a CPG firm or a digital marketing firm as to the type of business process they would want to see in a complete solution, right? All the way from where you know you collaborate on a campaign and a campaign concept to where you give birth to that campaign concept and create all the assets for that campaign, whether they are images or videos, to where you define the content for that campaign and finally make that campaign engaging. Uh, by bringing in rich media capabilities and social engagement capabilities, right? So there's a whole life cycle to delivering a campaign here, which is cutting across many different systems and many different capabilities. And so if you if you are in a vendor demonstration and if that's really what your business need is and that's really why your business is investing in an WCXM solution, you want to push the vendor to say, can you demonstrate that end-to-end -end capability of being able to define a campaign from scratch and take it live with all of these with all of these you know capabilities built in. All right, and then the last one is really the need to get hands-on with the package, right? I think many of you already do this, uh, but I think it's important to realize that you know there is a difference between reading an evaluation sheet, between seeing a vendor demo versus getting hands-on with it, right? And the flavor of how you get hands-on with it may differ. Some of you may you know, prefer to do sandbox deployments, so you're doing trials of the package using evaluation licenses or equivalent. Some of you may be doing prototyping, some of you may be doing proof of concepts. Uh, whichever way, the point is that you need to get exposed enough to how the package works so that all your stakeholders across IT, across business and editors have the chance to see it in action and have the chance to kind of make a more informed decision, you know, one way or the other. Uh, this is also the opportunity to mitigate risk in particular, if you've got you know specific integration points or specific uh, areas of concern, it could be, for example, a single sign-on integration, a security integration, an analytics integration, and maybe you've already got some software in your enterprise that you need to figure out how to integrate with. This is a good opportunity to use a sandbox to test that out and mitigate the risk by saying, will this work? Will the two work together or not? Right. All right, so summing it up, we're pretty much coming to the end of this. Uh, if you think about the overall journey for an effective WCXM package selection, it's really a couple of phases, right? You, as we said, you start with the definition of the business problem and the key use cases, and then you map those to what you want in the name of solution capabilities, right? 
Uh, so you start with saying my business use case is to increase higher conversion. How do I do that? Well, I do that by delivering more personalized experiences and by engaging people uh, in interactions with the brand, which means I need more social capabilities and I need more personalization capabilities, fair enough. And from there, you start to identify, you know, which are the potential package candidates who can deliver some of those capabilities, right? Excuse me. Right, so then you essentially have a long list of packages that you're trying to, you know, validate some of those capabilities against. And from there, you're trying to go to a short list. And as I mentioned earlier, you don't want to, you know, build a 500 line item evaluation criteria to go from your long list to short list. You want to leverage the information already available, both from industry research and probably your own expertise, to rapidly go through that process and narrow it down to the, you know, the two or three ones that you want to spend more time on, right? Um, and thereafter, you're really taking a very business-centric approach to evaluating these solutions, right? Where you're saying, let's define the key business scenarios that articulate those real-life usage models for how the package will really be used. Um, let's validate the shortlist against those scenarios and see how they perform. When we bring in vendors to do product demos, let's give them the scenarios right up front so that they are not coming in and showing us their standard demo or their can demo. They are tailoring that demo to our business process and to our business scenarios. And then finally, you know, both time permitting as well as you know, need permitting, you would plan to do some test deployments and POCs, again, driven by those business scenarios, right? So we've been involved, for example, in bake-offs where the customer has agreed on the final two products in the consideration, and we've been asked to do a proof of concept to prove certain capabilities for package A versus package B. And, and some of these are paid engagements. Customers at times choose to pay money, but if you look at you know, the, the value of that small investment of four to five weeks of a proof of concept to validate your final tool for a platform that you will probably invest a million dollars in licensing and three years of maintenance with it, uh, it's probably very minuscule and it's probably more than worth it at times, right? Um, and then really is really where you need to bring all your stakeholders together and, and you know, figure out what the recommendation is, but also drive implementation readiness. Keep in mind that a lot of this is not about technology. It is about is your business ready to move ahead with a particular solution? Is your IT team ready to move ahead with a particular solution? Do organizational changes need to happen um, you know, in the company that is, that is choosing a particular package or a solution before they can you know, buy it? Buying the product is probably an easier thing. Paying the money and getting the license is probably easier. The tougher part may be getting ready to implement it in terms of how, how they are organized, how their business is set up, how their IT is set up, and so on and so forth. Right? And ultimately, that leads to a recommendation around the preferred package. All right, so that pretty much concludes it. I wanted to leave you with some references, uh, material that kind of inspired me over the years as I was uh, as I was ramping up on this topic and as I've done package selections for numerous clients. Uh, would definitely recommend two in particular here from the Forrester and the Real Story Group. Their their scenario-based technology evaluation process, which is which is very you know in line with what I have talked about earlier about business scenarios, and also Real Story Group. For those of you who know them as an analyst firm, they have a they have a shortlist builder tool, which is again very interesting. It allows you to almost you know map your business needs to one of the common scenarios for why you may choose to implement a WCM solution uh, or a WCXM solution. Uh, and then kind of tries and map it down to say, if this is your scenario, these are the five products you should consider, and so on and so forth. So we we'll definitely recommend taking a look at those. Other than that, there's a very interesting video show hosted by CMS Connected, for those of you who follow them, uh, uh, in, in partnership with a firm called the Digital Clarity Group, where they've talked about how to select a content management system. And finally, for those of you who are really interested in more detail on this topic beyond what you have in this webinar, and beyond the slides, I'm sure you get a recording of this webinar for offline reference, but uh, there's a whole white paper on the topic that I wrote uh, recently, uh, which is a more detailed version of this webinar. It has the same content, but there's a more detailed version of it. For those of you who are interested in reading it, it's available on our public website at, at Sapien Nitro. Uh, so please feel free to download it from there and take a look. Please feel free to share your comments as well. Uh, more than happy to hear your views on the topic. All right, so that pretty much concludes our webinar for today, just about on the hour. Uh, I will open up the chat panel now and take a look at what questions are here. Okay, so I see a few questions that have come through. Let me read through them and I'll try and answer them. Uh, in the meanwhile, guys, if you have other questions, feel free to keep typing them in. 
Okay, so there's a question here. I'm just reading it through. It says, for domain-specific problems, say retail, investment, banking, telecom, are there specific evaluations or suggestions on the WCXM packet selections? Okay, great question. So keep in mind that the process in terms of how you approach a packet selection, and that's what we discussed here, doesn't necessarily change based on the domain, right? You still need to go through some of this due diligence that we've discussed here and understanding the reason why a retail client or a telecom client is, is investing in a WCXM is important. So absolutely, uh, you know, you do want to make sure that the guidelines and best practices we've discussed here are applied. With that said, yes, there, there is an affinity of certain packages working better in certain industries. If you look at some of the more enterprise players out there, you know, the Oracles, the Adobe's, the IBM's, or the autonomies of the world, they've got clients across these industries, so they've probably got deployments everywhere. With that said, yes, some of them will have niche offerings for, for specific clients in specific industries as well. Particularly in the media and the telecom, you know, sector, you would find very specific packages that are well suited for media-based clients. Uh, so there's a little bit of a niche there. But the, but the larger point to be made is that the packet selection process doesn't necessarily change in terms of how you approach it regardless of, you know, who the client is and what their domain is. Uh, so hope that helps. All right, then our next question here coming up that says, is it feasible to change our app in one CMS to another CMS, i.e. from media surface to open source type of 3? So yeah, absolutely, great question. Uh, migrations across CMS packages are the other very big reason or probably the biggest reasons why you know, packet selections are even undertaken. So, you know, your use case is very similar to several others where customers come in and say, we've got a CMS and here's the pain points we have with it and it's not working for us and we are considering migrating to another CMS and we, we want to either go to CMS X <coughs> or we want to do a packet selection to figure out which one is best, right? And, and there's two facets to that. The first facet is how do you work with your customer to define, you know, why they want to invest in a new CMS. So what is the real pain point? Is it that their business needs are not getting met? Is there an issue with how we implemented the original platform? What really went wrong with it? Uh, and, you know, what is causing them to think of a re-platform? In some cases, you may find that the package itself, you know, is not capable of delivering their needs, and their needs have gone much higher than maybe when they selected that package a year back. So perhaps there's a good reason for you to, you know, uh, re-platform and go to a new package, absolutely. In which case, the next logical question is, do you have a solid understanding of what they really want to do with the new CMS? And that's where the trap is, right? The trap is not about switching packages. It's not about, today I will do package A, tomorrow I'll do package B. That's not probably the right way to approach it. The right way to approach it is, what is causing you to re-platform, and how do you know when you're recommending package B that that will actually deliver what you want versus you run into the same issue again and again, right? So it's important to kind of think about it from the perspective of what your customer wants and why they are trying to re-platform uh, and then get to the details of saying, okay, can we migrate from A to B and what will it take from port it from A to B and so on and so forth. All right, I hope that helped. Um, there's a next question here saying, from a CMS developer perspective, what is the major impact of this transition from WCM to WCXM? Meaning, does it improve the scope of the careers of CMS developers? Wonderful question, and thank you for asking that. It's a great question. So there's two things it does, in my opinion, right? Uh, one, it tells us that the breadth of what we are dealing with is, is gone larger, right? Uh, while we could worry about technical skills and creating content types and workflows and templates and components a few years back, that is really the starting point now. Now we need to worry about things like personalization algorithms and rules engines and social engagement and how do you in integrate social into your experience or, or even things like rich media asset processing and not just workflows for content approval and authoring but workflows for video processing and workflows for image processing, right? So, so the breadth of what you're dealing with is larger. Absolutely, it does improve career scope as well because now you're dealing with a larger functional problem to deal with and that's really, that's really something that consumers have driven, you and I have driven it. The fact that you and I go to Facebook and expect the same content and experience than when we go to the website or then when we go to the mobile channel, that consumer behavior has really driven that shift if you think about it. So the short answer is yes, absolutely. It, it does uh, improve career opportunities. It also expands the breadth of you know, what you need to be well versed with um, and the landscape of solutions that you need to be well versed with. So it's no more just the WCM, it's WCM and NAM and social and so on and so forth. 
All right, great. Hope that helped. Um, all right, there's another question here saying how it will help us as I'm a UI and UX, and UX architect. OK, I assume that is user interface and user experience architect. Again, great question. Um, so there's a couple of things, right? As user experience architects, you guys are probably designing the customer experience, right? You guys are probably designing how customers interact with this. And to that extent, you're probably now dealing with situations where you're not just designing web experiences, you're designing mobile experiences and native apps and social experiences and even you know rich, uh, rich internet applications such as maybe gaming experiences, right? There's also a heavy shift to physical computing where the experience is no more just delivered on a web or a mobile device, but a physical device. It could be a kiosk at a store, it could be a display interface, it could be even be a billboard, right, which could be digitally powered. So if you think about that, the boundaries of your customer experience touch points have now exploded quite a lot, right, beyond the traditional website. And as a result of that, from a back-end perspective, we are asking the question of, okay, how can my system deliver the same content in an optimized presentation to these various different interfaces from a user experience perspective, you guys are asking the question of how can we consume content in many, many different formats but optimize it for the experience. For example, the mobile experience is obviously going to be much more optimized than the web experience and how do we deal with that, right? So those, those are the ways in kind of which you need to think about the solution going forward. All right, I hope that helps. Uh, Another question here, what are the different types of CMM for small business organizations? I assume you meant CMS, uh, hopefully. Uh, all right, um, so, so yeah, again, good question. Uh, there's, clearly a, there's clearly a landscape out there, and for those of you who are really interested, I'd recommend you go to therealstorygroup.com, their website. They have this lovely little vendor map diagram, and their vendor map diagram is pretty elaborate. It covers uh, all types of players, from enterprise players to mid-tier players to open source players. So you'll get a view of the you know different uh, different grades, if I can use that word, of players in the market and the size and scale of their solutions. Small business organizations could look to various ways of deploying CMS solutions. They could they could even use enterprise DWCM solutions, but they could probably use it in a in a SaaS model or in a managed services model, as we call them, where they're probably bearing the cost of the solution more from a usage perspective or more from a paper use model as opposed to an upfront license investment. Uh, with the shift to cloud computing, there's a lot of impetus, and Sapien Nitro does a lot of work as well, where we offer cloud-based managed service solutions to our customers, uh, and in that you have the opportunity to work with the with the vendor, with the WCM product vendor, to negotiate models where you charge your customers by licensing. We have our own partnership with several of our premium partners, where we offer such services to customers, and the advantage there is, you know, even though you're buying an enterprise product, you're paying by usage or by license or by things like size of your deployment, and so you can still afford a heavyweight enterprise package. So that's one way of looking at it. The other way of looking at it is you could certainly choose to leverage the open source community, and you could look at the realm of open source CMS solutions out there, um, and you know figure out which ones work for your need. Keep in mind that obviously depending on what level of support you have behind that open source solution, you're probably as the integrator taking on the cost for you know both maintaining and managing the deployment. All right, there's one more question I see, uh, last one so far, which is, if the client is cost conscious and don't want to invest on a packet solution and prefers a bespoke development, what should be a consultant consideration in such a scenario? That's a wonderful question. I'm glad you asked. Um, so there's a couple of things, right? A, I think it is important to work away from the notion that bespoke development is cheap. Bespoke development is not always cheap. Bespoke development could actually be expensive. Uh, it completely depends on what you want. We work with customers who don't use packet solutions and use bespoke development for their CMSs. They typically do so because they have very, very specific needs which they are well aware they won't be able to easily get done by using one of the packet solutions, right? So if you're in that situation, you may need a bespoke development or you may even use a, a basic CMS and open source product as a baseline but then customize it very heavily to your needs, right? Uh, so the short answer to your question is, A, you know, first of all, it's important to work away from the mindset that bespoke development is always cheap, but then importantly, if the client is cost conscious, as I mentioned earlier, uh, you do need to keep in mind that there's a whole landscape of how you can deliver a package solution to them, right? Whether it's a, whether it's a managed services model or a cloud-based deployment model or a SaaS model or something else, so there are ways in which you can optimize that investment for the customer 
they don't necessarily need to pay a million dollars in licensing fee upfront to invest in the whole platform. Uh, you know, cloud computing, virtualization, and paper use models have all come together to make it much more easy for a customer to invest in it. Uh, you know, as an example, Adobe offers something called a cloud manager service, and the cloud manager and the cloud offering kind of offers a similar model of you know a hosted solution in the cloud with a different licensing model to it as well. Uh, so there are ways of how you can you know approach the problem and, and make it cost conscious. At the same time, as I said earlier, you always have the option of investing in an open source product, but then customizing it for your needs, uh, you know, based on what you have. And the only trade-off you need to be conscious of there is you don't want to spend nine months in customization, in which case you might realize that the, the integrator costs for developing that customization is probably the same as your original licensing fee. So you need to be a little careful about that. All right, hope that helps. Uh, I think that covers all the questions so far. Are there any other questions from anyone or moderator? Do you have any other questions? Just one more question. Okay, there's one more question coming up. Can you please clarify me once again how it helps a UI or a UX? Okay, it sounds like a continuation to the previous question. So, so as I said, there may be some context behind this that perhaps I don't understand, so apologies if that's the case. But, uh, but the concept of customer experience management and web content experience management is very relevant to a UI or UX professional from the perspective of the fact that it is you guys who manage a multi-channel customer experience and each of the interfaces that a consumer interacts with when they navigate through their experience. Whether that is a Facebook page, a Facebook fan page, or a Twitter community, or a mobile native app, or a mobile website, or a email campaign, or a web page. All of them are getting designed obviously by you guys as UI UX professionals. From a customer perspective, they need the same content to be delivered to each of these channels. However, they need that content to be optimized for each of those channels, right? And so if you think about it from that perspective, you're essentially talking about how do I take a WCXM solution and use it to deliver optimized content across each user interface and each user experience, which is not just a website, but it is every possible touch point or every possible channel that the consumer interacts with, which means that as WCXM developers, you guys need to now worry about how will templates and components get built for mobile, right? Whether we should use a responsive design strategy or whether we should do it some other way. How are we going to optimize the same web page and the same web experience and the same component uh, for delivery on one channel versus the other channel? So all of those are considerations that a UI or a UX professional needs to deal with. I hope that helps. All right, any final questions? We're just about ready to wrap up. Any last question? Okay, assuming not, I guess moderator, you can go ahead and close the call. Once again, thank you very much for taking out the time. Uh, I do hope you found this somewhat valuable. Uh, and I'm sure the recording will be available to you later for office interruption. So thank you. Well, thanks so much, Mr. Amit, for the insightful presentation. I'm really thankful to you for conducting this webinar. It was indeed a great session. I would also like to thank all our participants for their support in making this webinar a success. The recording of the session would be available on takeit.com by tomorrow. Thank you all. Have a great evening.